Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Learning Stethoscope. In today's video, we're diving into the anatomy of the spinal cord that connects the brain to the rest of the body. So, the spinal cord is safely protected within the vertebral column. The vertebral column is made up of a series of bony segments called vertebrae. These vertebrae are divided into five regions. We have seven cervical vertebrae in the neck region, 12 thoracic vertebrae in the upper and mid back, five lumbar vertebrae in the lower back, five sacral vertebrae, which are typically fused together to form the sacrum, and four coccygeal vertebrae, which are fused to form the coccyx, also called tailbone. This adds up to a total of 33 vertebrae. Now, the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system along with the brain, runs inside the vertebral canal. It begins at the medulla oblongata, the base of the brainstem, and extends down, ending around the level of L1 to L2 vertebrae in adults. The spinal cord itself is divided into 31 segments, each giving rise to a pair of spinal nerves. On the cervical region, we have eight pairs of spinal nerves, from C1 to C8, even though notice that there are only seven cervical vertebrae. On the thoracic region, we have 12 pairs of spinal nerves, from T1 to T12. On the lumbar region, we have five pairs of spinal nerves, from L1 to L5. On the sacral region, we have five pairs of spinal nerves, from S1 to S5. And finally, on the coccygeal region, we have only one pair of spinal nerves. This adds to a total of 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So, while the vertebral column has 33 vertebrae, the spinal cord has 31 spinal segments. And one of the main differences is on the cervical column. As we said before, the vertebral column has seven cervical vertebrae, but the spinal cord has eight cervical segments. Let's take a look at what happens. Here is a sagittal section of the spinal cord inside the vertebral column. Here we have the C1 spinal cord level, and here we have the C1 vertebrae. Now, notice how the C1 spinal nerve exits the spinal cord. It exits the spinal cord above its associated vertebra. So we can say that the C1 spinal nerve exits above the C1 vertebrae. And that's exactly what happens on the next cervical segments. So here we have the C2 spinal cord level, the C2 vertebrae, and the C2 spinal nerve exiting above the C2 vertebrae. And it's the same for the remaining cervical spinal nerves until C7. But here's the catch. We have a C8 spinal nerve, but no C8 vertebra. So this means that the C8 spinal nerve exits below the C7 vertebrae. That's something different to remember. Now we move on to the thoracic region. Here is the T1 spinal cord level. Here is the T1 vertebrae. And then the T1 spinal nerve exiting below its associated vertebrae. And that's exactly what happens for the next spinal nerves. So from the thoracic region downward, all spinal nerves exit below their corresponding vertebrae. And the same happens for the lumbar and the sacral region. Here, you can see all their spinal nerves exiting the vertebral column below their associated vertebra. Now, let's zoom out and recap. From C1 to C7, the spinal nerves exit above their corresponding vertebrae. The C8 spinal nerve exits below the C7 vertebrae. And from T1 down, meaning in the thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal regions, all the spinal nerves exit below their corresponding vertebrae. Now, another important concept to understand is called the vertebral segmental discrepancy. Notice that in the cervical and thoracic regions, the spinal cord levels and their corresponding vertebrae are closely aligned. For example, the C1 spinal cord level is located next to the C1 vertebrae. As a result, all the spinal nerves exit almost horizontally. But as we go down the spine, the spinal cord levels and their corresponding vertebral levels begin to separate. Take a look at the lumbar and sacral regions. The spinal nerves need to travel down inside the vertebral canal before exiting at their corresponding vertebra. So this gap between the spinal cord level and their corresponding vertebra is called vertebral segmental discrepancy. Notice that as we descend in the spinal cord into the lumbar and sacral regions, this vertebral segmental discrepancy gets bigger and bigger. Now, in adults, 
The spinal cord ends around the L1 to L2 vertebral level. The terminal part of the spinal cord is tapered and is called the conus medullaris. And below the spinal cord, meaning below the L1 to L2 level, inside the vertebral canal, we find a bundle of nerve roots that continue to descend before exiting at their respective levels. This bundle is called the cauda equina, which means horse's tail, due to its appearance. But why does the spinal cord end at the L1 to L2 level? Well, during early development in babies, the spinal cord and vertebral column are about the same length. However, as the baby grows, the vertebral column grows much faster and longer than the spinal cord. This means that by the time a person reaches adulthood, the spinal cord is much shorter than the vertebral column, ending around the level of L1 to L2. Because of this, the nerve roots for lower spinal nerves need to travel down inside the vertebral canal before exiting at their corresponding vertebral levels, forming the cauda equina. Okay, now we will move on to the blood supply of the spinal cord. Here we can see a transverse section of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a highly metabolic structure and relies on an extensive vascular network in order to function properly. Its blood supply comes from longitudinal arteries running along the cord and from segmental arteries entering at different levels. There are three main longitudinal arteries that run along the spinal cord. One anterior spinal artery, which arises from the vertebral arteries at the level of the medulla and travels down the anterior midline of the spinal cord. The anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. And then we have two posterior spinal arteries that also originate from the vertebral arteries or sometimes from the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And they run along the posterolateral aspect of the cord. They supply the posterior one-third of the spinal cord. To ensure adequate blood flow along the entire length of the spinal cord, the longitudinal arteries are reinforced by segmental medullary arteries, which arise from branches of the aorta and enter the spinal canal at various levels. In the cervical region, segmental arteries arise from the vertebral arteries and from the ascending cervical arteries. On the thoracic region, they arise from the posterior intercostal arteries, which are branches of the thoracic aorta. On the lumbar region, they arise from the lumbar arteries, which are branches of the abdominal aorta. And finally, on the sacral region, they arise from the lateral sacral arteries, which are branches of the internal iliac artery. Now, there is one specific artery that is important to remember. That is the artery of Adamkiewicz. The artery of Adamkiewicz is the largest and most important radicular artery because it provides major blood supply to the lower two-thirds of the spinal cord. This means that this artery is very important to maintain adequate blood flow to the lower thoracic, lumbar, and sacral spinal cord. It's clinically important to know about this vascular supply of the spinal cord because blockage of different spinal arteries can lead to infarction of specific areas of the cord, causing distinct neurological symptoms depending on whether motor or sensory tracts are affected. For example, blockage of the artery of Adamkiewicz, since it is a major supplier of the lower two-thirds of the spinal cord, can lead to paraplegia. There are other clinical spinal cord syndromes that we will discuss in another video. The segmental arteries we just mentioned travel toward the spinal cord and then bifurcate into the anterior and posterior radicular arteries. These radicular arteries enter the vertebral canal and help reinforce the anterior and posterior spinal arteries, supporting blood supply to the spinal cord at multiple levels. Now that we have talked about the arterial blood supply, it's time to move on to the spinal cord's venous drainage system. The venous system closely mirrors the arterial supply and is arranged in a network of veins that collect blood from the cord and return it to the systemic circulation. On the surface of the spinal cord, there are three anterior spinal veins and three posterior spinal veins running longitudinally along its length. These veins are interconnected by a rich network of smaller veins, creating a continuous venous ring around the cord. From here, blood drains into radicular veins, which accompany the spinal nerves as they exit through the intervertebral foramina. These radicular veins then empty into the internal vertebral venous plexus, also known as Batson's plexus, located in the epidural space. 
Finally, the internal vertebral venous plexus connects with the external vertebral venous plexus and drains into the segmental veins, such as the intercostal, lumbar, and sacral veins, which eventually empty into the azigo system and the inferior vena cava. Okay, that's enough about the venous system. Now let's talk about the spinal cord structure itself. In a cross section, the spinal cord has two important areas. First is the gray matter, which has this inner butterfly shape. It's called gray matter because it contains the neurons' cell bodies, which in pathological anatomic studies have this gray color. On the gray matter, we can see the dorsal or posterior horns, which receive sensory information through the spinal nerves. Then we have the ventral or anterior horns, which contain the cellular bodies of the motor neurons. And finally, we have the lateral horns that are found in thoracic and lumbar segments and house sympathetic neurons. Now, surrounding the gray matter, we find this white matter, which is composed of myelinated axons. These axons form pathways called tracts, or funiculi, and they carry information between the brain and the rest of the body. The white color comes from the myelin sheath, which acts like insulation and speeds up nerve transmission. The white matter is divided into three main regions, the posterior or dorsal columns, which contain ascending tracts that carry information about proprioception, vibration, and fine touch. Next is the lateral columns that contain the ascending lateral spinothalamic tract, which carries information of pain and temperature, and the descending lateral corticospinal tract, which carries information about motor voluntary control. And finally, the anterior column, which contains the ascending anterior spinothalamic tract and the descending anterior corticospinal tract. There are other smaller tracts that we will discuss in another video. It's important to know the location of these tracts because damage to specific regions of the spinal cord can lead to damage of specific tracts, which then causes predictable symptoms. For example, injury to the dorsal column can lead to loss of fine touch and vibration below the level of the lesion, and injury to the corticospinal tract can lead to weakness or paralysis below the lesion. So, based on the clinical symptoms, we can estimate the areas and levels of the spinal cord that are affected. We've just seen how the spinal cord is organized internally, but the spinal cord doesn't sit unprotected inside the vertebral column. It's wrapped in strong and delicate protective layers that act as both a shield and a support system. These layers are known as the meninges. Just like the brain, the spinal cord is covered by three layers of meninges. First is the dura mater, which is the tough outermost layer. The dura doesn't attach directly to bone. Instead, there's a space between the dura and the vertebral canal called the epidural space, which is filled with fat and venous plexuses. This space is clinically important because it's where epidural anesthesia is administered. Then we have the arachnoid mater, the middle layer. Between the arachnoid and dura mater, we find the subdural space. And finally, we have the pia mater, which is the delicate innermost layer that adheres directly to the surface of the spinal cord, following every groove and contour. It carries many tiny blood vessels that supply the spinal cord itself. Between the arachnoid and the pia mater, we have the subarachnoid space, where we find cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, which cushions the spinal cord, provides nutrients, and removes waste. The subarachnoid space is where we collect CSF during a lumbar puncture. Now the spinal cord communicates with the rest of the body through the spinal nerves, which are like wiring cables that connect the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. Each spinal nerve is the product of two sets of roots that emerge from the spinal cord. We have the dorsal or posterior root, which carries afferent fibers with sensory information from the body into the spinal cord. On this dorsal root sits the dorsal root ganglion, which contains the cell bodies of primary sensory neurons. Then we have the ventral or anterior root, which carries motor efferent fibers from the spinal cord to the muscles. The dorsal and ventral roots come together just outside the spinal cord to form the spinal nerve. From there, the spinal nerve splits into smaller branches. First, it's the dorsal or posterior ramus that goes posterior and bifurcates in two branches, 
the lateral muscle branch that innervates the deep back muscles, and the medial sensory branch that innervates the skin of the back. Then we have the ventral or anterior ramus. This is a much larger branch and carries sensory and motor information to the anterolateral trunk and the limbs. In the cervical, lumbar, and sacral regions, these ventral rami interweave to form plexuses, cervical, brachial, lumbar, sacral, which then give rise to the major peripheral nerves of the limbs. In the thoracic region, it becomes the intercostal nerves. Next, we have the meningeal branch, which is a small branch that re-enters the vertebral canal and innervates the meninges, ligaments, periosteum, and intervertebral discs. This branch is clinically relevant in discogenic back pain. Last but not least, we have the rami communicantes, which are small nerve branches that connect the spinal nerve, specifically its ventral ramus, to the sympathetic chain ganglia, which are part of the autonomic nervous system. There are two types, the white rami communicantes that carry preganglionic sympathetic fibers from the spinal nerve to the sympathetic chain. These are myelinated and only present from T1 to L2. And the gray rami communicantes that carry postganglionic sympathetic fibers from the sympathetic chain back to the spinal nerves in order to then reach target tissues, like sweat glands. These rami are not myelinated and are present at all spinal levels. Let's see how these nerves actually distribute their sensory and motor functions across the body. Each spinal nerve is responsible for a specific map of skin sensation and muscle control. The sensory fibers from each spinal nerve supply a specific region of skin called a dermatome. So we can define a dermatome as the area of skin that is innervated by sensory fibers from a single spinal nerve root. Imagine the body being divided into strips or zones. Each strip of skin is a dermatome and corresponds to a specific spinal cord level. Generally, the cervical nerves supply sensation to the arms and back of the head. The thoracic nerves innervate the chest and abdomen in horizontal bands. The lumbar nerves cover the front of the legs and inner foot. And the sacral nerves supply the back of the legs, outer foot, and genital area. So we can see that these dermatomes follow a relatively predictable pattern. For example, the thumb is mainly innervated by C6. The middle finger corresponds to C7, and the little finger is supplied by C8, and so on for the rest of the body. This means that knowing dermatomes is clinically important because if a patient loses sensation in a specific skin area, we can suspect which spinal cord level or nerve root might be affected. For example, if a patient has numbness or tingling in the skin over the thumb, it might indicate a problem in the C6 nerve root. On the other hand, the motor fibers of each spinal nerve control specific groups of muscles called myotomes. A myotome is a group of muscles innervated by the motor fibers of a single spinal nerve root. By testing certain movements, we can identify which nerve root might be affected in case of an injury. For example, shoulder abduction and elbow flexion are primarily controlled by the C5 myotome, while elbow extension is mainly controlled by C7. So, weakness in these movements may suggest a C5 or C7 nerve root lesion. This approach is clinically useful because testing different muscle groups can help doctors to identify nerve root or spinal cord injuries. For example, a herniated disc at L3, L4 can compress the L4 nerve root, which means that it can affect both the sensory area of the L4 dermatome, leading to numbness or tingling over the medial side of the lower leg and ankle, and it can affect the motor function of the L4 myotome, leading to weakness in ankle dorsiflexion, so pulling the foot up. And that wraps up our deep dive into spinal cord anatomy. If you found this helpful, like, share, and subscribe to the Learning Stethoscope. Stay curious and see you next time.